From time to time, I like to do series. Now, this series, I will tell you, my warning for you is that there's going to be ample opportunity to maybe take offense or use it against your spouse, whether it's unfaithful or betrayed. And there's going to be opportunity to maybe take something and run with it. Or, alternatively, there's going to be opportunity for you maybe it's unfaithful, maybe it's betrayed, to get offended and take it as though it's an attack upon you. And if you are new to this video blog, I just want to tell you that's never our goal, that's never my aim. We never do that. I do try and give you information that helps both of you and cares for both of you and tells you what it was like for me, for my wife Samantha, and for lots of other people that we've helped and, and helped navigate through the process of recovery from infidelity. So please don't take anything overly personal in this series. Please don't run with this and use it to try and kind of stab at your mate because it doesn't really work. I hope that you will take this and listen to it objectively in an effort to first help yourself and maybe as an effort to uh, use it as an opportunity to share with your spouse and go, look, I think this is something that I've been trying to say to you, or is this what you've been trying to say to me? When you watch a video blog like this about a topic like this, it can be very easy, it can be very tempting to take something, run with it, and kind of use it to beat your spouse over the head with it. That will fail miserably. Please don't do that. This will be an opportunity to have a very vulnerable heart-to-heart -heart discussion about giving your marriage, a chance at recovery, or even giving yourself an opportunity to find safety in recovery. So I've entitled this new series, Are You Safe Enough to Give Your Marriage a Chance? Because you as a person are responsible for creating your own safety, meaning you becoming a safe person to your spouse or partner is really in your responsibility. It's absolutely necessary that your spouse feels safe or else they are not going to engage you in recovery at any meaningful level because they'll feel unsafe, which means they will not be able to trust you, not be able to trust your efforts, not be able to be vulnerable with you, not be able to connect with you, and be very apprehensive to even engage in heavy conversations because they don't feel safe. And when a Spouse doesn't feel safe, they usually won't do therapy with you, they won't do an EMS weekend with you, they don't want to have very intense conversations with you or, or really engage at a vulnerable level because they're constantly worried that you are going to rage at them or flip the script on them or attack them or use their vulnerability against them and on and on and on. You see, if you can't be a safe person, you'll really never know if the marriage can make it because until you can be safe, you are not really giving the marriage a shot. Until you can be safe, you're not really giving your spouse equal opportunity to evaluate how you're doing, how the marriage is doing, and what the future can look like because you are constantly unsafe. There was a time when I was unsafe in our recovery. I was constantly defensive. I was minimizing. I was blaming. I wasn't really wanting to talk about the details of the affair or Samantha's pain or Samantha's hurt. I was doing a number of things that basically made me unsafe for Samantha to be vulnerable with, to engage in recovery methods with, and to feel like we could give the marriage a shot. So I just really appeal to both of you, unfaithful and betrayed. Becoming a safe person is your responsibility. No one can do it for you. Unfaithful spouse, you have to make yourself safe for your spouse. Betrayed spouse, you ha yes, you have to make yourself safe for your unfaithful spouse to communicate with. Now, immediately, that can be one of the first controversial points. But let me expand. When you're a betrayed spouse, if you're going to give your marriage a chance, if you're going to be a safe person, you cannot do what a, what a small faction of betrayed spouses do which is say, because you have cheated, all bets are off, I will do what I want, say what I want, rage as much as I want, you, unfaithful, have to take it, 
You must take it. You must take everything that I do, scream, yell, humiliate, belittle, berate you, physically attack you, whatever. Whatever it is that I choose to do, you must endure it because you cheated. And I'm sorry, I just want to appeal to you today. That is not being a safe person, which means it will not give the marriage an opportunity at recovery because you are using your hurt as an opportunity to transmit that pain to your spouse, to your marriage, possibly to your family, and it's a sense of entitlement that will undermine the whole fabric of recovery because you're not safe and eventually your unfaithful spouse will refuse to communicate or engage with you because you're not safe and then the whole process breaks down not because of the infidelity but because of the inability for one spouse to be safe. Equally true is the fact that the unfaithful spouse must be a safe person which means the unfaithful count can't continually resort to minimizing, blaming, attacking, harassing, and using every opportunity to say, well, if you didn't do X, I wouldn't have done Y. So it's your fault that I cheated. That is not safety. And as I kind of go on through the series, I will approach and talk about both of those mannerisms or approaches, if you will. Because see, safety is your responsibility. You are not responsible to create safety in your spouse. That is your spouse's job, whether they be unfaithful or whether they be betrayed. Your safety is your responsibility. It is up to you to be a safe person. You cannot control what your spouse does. You're not supposed to be able to control them. You can only control you. Their job is to make themselves safe, which creates a very harmonious, uh, sense of oneness in the recovery process. You see, without safety, there really isn't much opportunity for momentum. Without safety, there's not really a lot of opportunity for an objective evaluation of you or your spouse or the marriage or the marriage's future because one or both spouses aren't safe. I see so many situations that fall apart because one spouse won't make themselves safe. One spouse is trying to be safe and create safety, but one spouse will do a number of different things that we'll talk about, and it completely erodes the recovery process. As I go through this series, I'm going to make an attempt to try and say things like, a safe person does this, or this is what safety looks like, or if you're going to be safe in your marriage or safe in recovery, you're going to have to stop doing this or you're going to have to be willing to do that. Now, as I warned you on the front end, there's opportunity here to really kind of get offended. I don't want you to be offended. I want you to absorb the information and really process it. If you still get offended, you still get offended. At the end of the day, the goal here is never to be controversial for controversial sake or to kind of, you know, create this controversial discussion so that we'll get more likes or get more attention or, or, or get more views. Not one bit do I or the producers at any level want to do that. But there's going to be some very heart-to-heart -heart discussions that are going to have to be made, and I hope, I pray, I appeal to you to grab hold of them objectively and ask yourself, are you a safe person for your marriage. Is your spouse, in light of what we're talking about, a safe person? And if you're not, then hopefully you'll have some good cues and some good directives on how to become a safe person because all of your recovery depends upon the ability to be a safe person. Mm -hmm.